so this is the part where it starts recording. Okay. It is happening. Awesome. <laughs> the recording is going. It's always a big moment for me. As you notice, like in the beginning, I'm always like, the recording has begun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to just say, I just want to give a little bit of background to people who are tuning in because um, you are a special, per- you are a very special person, Ryan Fan. You are uh, my partner in Invisible Illness, which is a medium publication. And maybe if somebody is only listening to the podcast, they're just starting to understand what this medium publication is or what medium is. So I just wanted to give a little background and say that medium is a platform where people can write their stories and share their stories. Publications are where there are editors that work on getting those stories and putting them out through larger gatherings through publications and and invisible illness is the largest mental health publication on medium. I have been working on it for a few years and then all of a sudden an angel named Ryan fan showed up and he said I want to be a part of this like how can I get involved and frankly you have been in a force of nature since the moment you started. So I'm, I'm so grateful to you. Like, basically, I feel like Invisible Illness would not be anywhere <laughs> near where it is now without you. Um, so thank you. Can you tell me about your earliest memories of, of sort of joining the publication or, or sort yeah. of what you remember about that? Yeah, thanks a lot, Mary. That means, um, that means a lot. <laughs> I think that doesn't need to be said. But I think it was, um, I mean, I started on Medium of March of last year, like 2019. And I saw like one of my, you know, I'd come around the same time one of my friends joined. Um, and, you know, she was, she had some role in some industry group and on campus. And I saw she, I didn't really know what a publication was when I first started on Medium. You know, they don't really tell you these things sometimes, but um, I saw Invisible Illness. I was like, oh, like, this seems really cool. Let me try to, let me try to write for them. Um, so I think I joined you, I joined you guys. And then um, like some of my pieces did really well with Invisible Illness. So I was like, oh, like, is there any way I can help? And I think I, I didn't reach out to you directly because I think I reached out to Rita at the time. Um, and then, yeah, it was now, and now <laughs> I'm very involved. Um, and <laughs> your, you know. your pieces did so well and they continue to do so well. When did you start writing about mental health? Like, how did that all get started? Yeah, um, I think it was in around 2015. I was doing some public, I was part of some publication in college that's, pretty similar medium um probably doesn't have the same same kind of standard but you know it's like it was it really got me um acclimated to writing a lot uh of you know putting a lot of quality into my pieces very quickly and like because I had a lot of quotas to meet every week or I remember it was like and where week. tell us like let's situate you where was this college where were you at the time when this was happening yeah I was at Emory in Atlanta um so Emory University, it's uh, it's kind of like outside the city a bit, but um, and what made you want to start working on that public or working with that? Like, how, were you always a writer? Um, no, not really. Um, especially not in high school. I only started joining the newspaper later on, but I think it was like the summer before my freshman year of college, and like uh, there was one guy in my cross country team, Max, who had been working on this thing called like the Odyssey Online. Um, for a while so I joined you know he was recruiting and I was joining because um, you know I knew who Max was you know uh, and like he was he was kind of like a mentor figure to me for a long time so um, that's how I got into it and I remember the the requirements for you had to write an article every week 500 words or more and I was like oh my gosh this is so much like I don't know what to write about I'm running out of ideas you know and then now it's like I can do that three four times a day so you know it really got me just like acclimated to it um, how do you do it i i am so astonished at your output like h- how do you write so- and i also want to cover that you have a full life a full job numerous jobs but you're a high school st- teacher in baltimore right high school yeah now i'm high school special ed uh, i used to be okay. I was middle school earlier in the year um but i always wanted to do high school as part of my um as like my target like age but um, it's kind of a funny story about how I taught middle school. I was just told by my principal last minute, oh, man, you're in the middle school now. Like, we need a middle school English uh, special educator. I'm like, okay, you know. So 
Um, and what does special ed mean exactly? Like how many kids, what are you teaching? Mm -hmm. So there's like a bunch of models and I think the movement in education is towards more and more, the word is inclusion, um, which means they're more integrated with the general education classroom. My, I did um, self-contained, which is uh, probably the most restrictive on like uh, environment where like they're the kids that like have services outside the general education classroom. So that's what I did last year, all of last year. And I also did um, something called pull out where you get the kids who have special education services a couple times a week, depending on their IEPs and stuff. Um, and so, what kind, so what level of support do they need? Like what's going on with these kids? Yeah, a lot of them need, like most of my kids just need a lot of support um, in general, especially. Is it an inner city, city school? Like what's the makeup and demographic of the school? Yeah, we were all black and then we had, I think two Hispanic kids, one white kid or something like that. Um, but yeah. I mean, and Baltimore is one of those places that is like, you know, it's really, it's not doing so well. I mean, you're in a, in a really intense place in a really intense job. I've always, I, I've told you this before, but I really admire that about you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't easy yet, like most of the time. Um, and I think like once the pandemic hit and, um, you know, I had a lot more time to myself and not in like in the physical building. Uh, my kids had a lot of trouble, you know, finding the technology, internet and like navigating stuff online. So I apologize. But um, yeah, like that definitely made it easier on me. But I don't think it was like the online learning part hasn't been the most, you know, beneficial to their education. So yeah. Um, how did you how are you a lighthouse for others, Ryan? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of people would say that I'm positive, but I don't like, I don't always feel that way, you know, or like, I try to be consistent and just like, just try to show up and like pitch in in day to day situations wherever I can. Um, and like, that comes a lot more in practice than it does really in theory. But, um, you know, I think I, that's huge. That is yeah. huge. Like just showing up and being consistent Again, that's like one of the things I really noticed about you as a co-editor is I could really rely on you. Like I knew you would be there. You were always showing up. And that's, that's actually pretty rare. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like in the school system, like that was definitely a huge asset, um, I think, to uh, my administration and just to the school in general. I mean, I mean I'm not going to be at my best every day, but, you know, I, you know, I will be able to show up and try to do the best I can for the kids and stuff like that. What gives you the, the energy to do that? Like how, how do you, how do you find the fuel? Um, I really rely, I really rely on my faith, but also just, um, you know, there are a lot of things I pray about, like, you know, behind the scenes, but I also need to prioritize just taking care of myself and resting a lot more than I did um, in college per se early on in my life, you know, and you're Christian. Are you like, do you, are you a denomination of Christian? Yeah. Presbyterian. Presbyterian. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's an important part of your life. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Go to church every week? I don't know. Like what, what does that look like? Yeah. Um, we, I, I mean, I used to go to physical church every week. Um, but you know, the pandemic hit. Yeah. It doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Online church kind of isn't the same, but it's like, it's still a really important part of my life. So do you know a lot of people through church? Is that like part of your social world? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And just a lot. It, it was like the first thing I really did when I came to Baltimore because um, I was trained to be a teacher. And then, you know, I was trying to find a church to kind of support me through that. And that was, and they, you know, they have ever since. Are there, are there a lot of other teachers who, like, what are the other teachers like at the school? Um, there's like a huge diversity of people just like any others. I mean, they're all, like my friends who are teachers are all, they're just all a lot of fun to be around, you know, um, they're, they're really funny, you know, they, and they really do care about, they really do care about the work and about the kids, but you know, it's like, it's a long, you know, school year is a long slog, you know. Oh my God. Yeah. And like the system, I imagine often feels like it's stacked up against you. Like things aren't well supported. There's not a ton of funding. I'm just imagining you're dealing with that stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. So they were the ones I definitely turned to for, you know, the, you know, the most camaraderie during the course of the year, you know, they were just like, I don't know, like, 
even even today, like I'm really close with all the people I was trained with, all the teachers that um, the teachers that I was in the building with. It's just like that kind of solidarity and like you know they they understood it like the struggle more than mm -hmm. anyone else you know. So do you have other teachers in your family? And are you from Baltimore? I'm not originally from Baltimore, no. Um, and I think my grandmother was a teacher, but she was a teacher in China and like, um, you know, she's, she's been out of the game for a while, but, <laughs> um, yeah, I originally, we, I grew up near Baltimore. I mean, I, I was born near Baltimore, um, in Rockville, Maryland, which is like Montgomery County. Um, and then we moved to Philadelphia and then we moved to New York. Then I, I moved to China for two years after that, but I was still oh, really wow. young. Yeah. Yeah. And then what was what job did your parent have that you were moving yeah my dad was he was like an internal medicine doctor in china but i think once like he immigrated to the states the credentials didn't really transfer over um so he kind of had to redo his certification and at the time he was working a lot of uh different research jobs and like biomedical related um obviously but uh he had to move around a lot for whichever was you know, whichever is better. My mom has been like waitressing or doing other stuff um, for a really long time. So uh, the two of them were kind of just struggling to get by. And I think when I was two, like, you know, I was sent to live with my grandparents and stuff like that for a couple of years. Is that before. when you went to China? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember it? Uh, not really. I mean, I was, I was just too young at the time. But yeah. I remember coming back to the States uh, with my grandparents and then ever since I've been, you know, we, we grew up in various parts of the city, New York City, Long Island, and like, eventually it just got like contained to New York, but we definitely moved around a lot before then. And are they in New York now? Yeah, uh, my mom's in New York and my dad's working in West, like in a VA home in West Virginia. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a hard place to be right now with COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Has he so, gotten sick? Uh, yeah. no, like, I actually don't think West Virginia has had too many cases. Oh, good. I'm not sure if anything has. Been. Do you worry about him? Are you worried? Yeah. I worry, especially about, uh, I worry about him, but especially about my mom and grandparents when they were in New York. Uh, yeah. When it was in spike, you know. But everyone was fine. Mm hmm Good. Um, there is this part of the podcast that we are embarking on now, which is I want to give you the freedom to talk about something that you're interested in. It can be anything. Mm -hmm. um, so is there any topic that like you have wanted to talk about more that you haven't gotten a chance to in, in other ways? Um, I mean, I just want to say like, pay it back. You know, I, you know, I really enjoy working on the publication too. And like, I really want to thank you for bringing me on like last, what was it? July? I remember at the time it was just inconvenient because I was going to a wedding and everything and I couldn't do as much work as, <laughs> I wanted to, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that I've been able to contribute and, um, helping get Juliet on board too. You know, that was really, um, really, really cool because, you know, um, I was part of all on medium. I didn't really get too much traction like early on, I think. Um, now personal. you're like a star on medium. <laughs> yeah. Like at the time, like, I mean, I do want to thank everyone that's like, uh, really helped me and still been around, you know, I mean, Nikki and Juliet, you know, I've been, I've interacted with them since like I first started on the platform and um, we, I was a part of a lot of these Facebook groups about like on medium and that's how I came to really know them and like build a lot of these connections. Um, and, you know, like I do want to pay, you know, I still want to pay it back. So I'm still pretty involved in them. Um, but like just, and that's how I met Ashwini too, um, who, who I'm pretty close to on the platform as well. So it's what do you like, want people to know about medium that they may not realize? Like if somebody is hearing this or watching this and they don't even know what we're talking about, like what, what do you think is a, is an interesting thing to know about medium? I think it's just a great place, uh, not only to make your voice heard, but to just see like a lot of, you know, great content. Um, I don't like, I guess I've been in like the, the medium world for so long that, I know a lot of people talk about things like curation and, you know, um, other stuff like that, but it's just, it's just a lot of fun to me. Um, and it is just like a lot of fun as in like, and you have such more of an active voice in on medium than you do if you're just like, you know, reading the New York times or 
I don't yeah, know. I feel like they're very genuine connections. Like now our channel, we have a Slack channel that we work on together um, of people who want to write for Medium joining us. And then we offer free editorial support for those people. And, um, and you really, it's really hands-on in a way that a lot of other places you can't be quite as hands-on in that way. So it's really cool. Yeah, yeah. I definitely agree um, with that. Ryan, are you an overthinker? I'd say so, yeah. I mean, I think that's how, like, a big part of how I'm able to write so much, you know. Um, and, like, I feel like there is a certain translation that comes from thinking to writing. But um, I guess the topics I choose only come because I, you know, I think about them a lot. And then they find their way onto a page. So Does overthinking ever, um, is it ever harmful in your life or, or just difficult in any way? Yeah, it used to be. Um, and, like, especially when I was like, you know, when I was growing up, I struggled with like a lot of anxiety, you know, middle school, high school, but and it's not like it's really gone away, but it's like, um, I'm, I was able to like really, really, really prioritize like running at the time because that made me stop overthinking a bit. Um, and like that built, that gave me a lot of relationships that, you know, um, that are still really important to me to this day. And and you oh, ran marathon, or you still run yeah. marathons, right? You're a marathon runner. Yeah, I'm trying, uh, but right, it's been hard since the pandemic. Um, and actually, later today, I'm going to run an all-out two-mile on some track nearby. It's kind of like some summer race series, but it's not as serious as it used to be. And so, in college, were you a super serious runner? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I was on the cross-country team, and then um, I'd run a marathon in Savannah, Georgia which is, I was lucky because Savannah is a very flat city. Baltimore is not a flat city at all, but hmm. I was able to run like 240 in Savannah. And I'm like, and Ooh. I wish it wasn't so good the first time because now I'm always chasing, you know, like, right. oh, I ran 240, I can do it again. But that hasn't really like panned out since then. It sounds like it would be hot. Was it hot there or was it like in a cooler season when you did that one? Luckily, uh, it's usually really hot, but it was November, um, November third i think and it was also 55 degrees at the time so just a lot of lucky factors between the course and the conditions when you run as an overthinker does it help your does it help you organize your thoughts and like come up with ideas is it like meditation kind of yeah like sometimes it can be um but i really do just struggle running alone like i struggle with pacing myself or getting too much too deep in my own thoughts and stuff like that um and then I used to always be too tied to like the results part of running like I gotta be running this pace you know or at this this much and like um I'm really trying to separate myself from that because it's meant you know it's supposed to be like just you know just for me just for fun and like now like, it's like writing like, though too right I mean when yeah. you're writing it's hard not to be like what how many people read this is it curated is it this it's the same thing kind of right yeah yeah a lot of it is really the same thing and um for me like i, I kind of had to separate from the whole the whole results part of running especially because um it's not that it's, it's toxic but you can really really just like uh obsess over like um yeah. i need to run this time you know i need to yeah. i don't know it's like and I'm, I'm glad that you know i don't have i don't feel that much pressure about it anymore yeah that makes a lot of sense do you have any tips for people of like things that you've learned about overthinking of like, you know, how to handle it or anything that's worked for you ever? Yeah. Um, I guess like I, I'm just trial and error, like type of person, just like anyone else. Um, but for me, like, you know, writing helps a lot. Um, I like, you know, I love to just write about whatever I'm thinking about. Um, and, you know, I mean, I used to really struggle being alone and like, you know, a couple of years ago, even, and now, like, I'm more comfortable with it now, because I'm able to find those outlets for, uh, for myself, and, you know, just be able to have those coping mechanisms, like running or writing, and, you know, I'm lucky to have that these days, where, whereas I did Do you before. feel like um, writing helps people understand you more? Like, is that a useful element of writing as well? Yeah, absolutely, uh, and I think, like, you know, who I am as a writer versus just who I am as I navigate real life, you know, it can be different because it's like, it's a window into someone's mind, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what, or part in mind, that's what writing always is. And you don't always see that 
in like for the person you just like you just pass on the sidewalk or something like that um, which I love that point I love that point because I always thought I was such an open book and that people really understood me but it wasn't really until starting to write and working on Beautiful Voyager that I realized like wait they had no idea they did not understand like the writing helped helped give a window for myself and others to understand Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and I always just love like you know I have most of the times when I write a piece I have no idea where it's going to go or like I have no idea for where the end is going to be until I'm you know close to finishing the end um I was just working on something before this about uh just like how bad I can be at keeping in touch with people I haven't seen in a long time you know like a common problem we all have and like it didn't start out as that but it kind of like was something I was thinking about and then it naturally gravitated there if you want, what do you think are some good pieces for, of yours for people to read to, to really get a sense of you? Or, I don't know, pieces that you're proud of? Or what should someone read? Yeah, um, it's a hard question because I think, like, part of what has made the out, like, I guess the output so prolific but not compromising any quality was just, like, me not getting too attached to any one piece of writing. You know, like, you can... Cause I used to get like really attached to some pieces of writing and then I put it out there and then, you know, it didn't get as much attention as I thought like the effort warranted or so I was like, you know, on to the next one, on to the next one, you know, like, and that's like, that's been my strategy since, but, um, less attached, less yeah. attached, more about the process. Yeah. Yeah. So I try not to like, I try to write it and then be, you know, just put it, try to put it away and like, you know, maybe, or take a look at it, um, at a later point, and, like, it's always strange rereading my writing, it's like, ooh, I wouldn't do this now, or, like, ooh, I wouldn't, like, <laughs> compose a sentence like that anymore, or, um, well, this was, if it's, like, from a long time ago, it's like, wow, this is horrible, and, like, it's true, uh, but we do that, change, we evolved, it's okay to look at the earlier stuff. Yeah, and I think, uh, probably, like, some of my proudest pieces of writing are just, like, not things I would really put on medium, you know, just, like, things I've written for like my friends or family and stuff like that um I was gonna ask if your family reads your stuff on medium sometimes but they it's just like my friends they say like it's too much and they can't keep up <laughs> do you ever do a Ryan fan newsletter I mean you do a newsletter for medium but do you ever like send out stuff you're writing to people um I send out some of the I don't really send out newsletters, but I'll do, I'll send out pieces to people who might be interested in or like friends that I may have vaguely mentioned, but you know, not by name or anything because of confidentiality. So yeah. what is like, the, what is the best way for someone to follow your work? What if you, how would, if somebody saw this and they were like, I'm interested. Uh, probably just like, like my medium profile, you know? Yeah. That's just where everything is just condensed in one. Um, I'll put and it I, on the, I'll put it in the description. Yeah. And I also try not to be like constrained to any one topic, you know, or just like, I do feel like they're all kind of interconnected. So, um, and I do have like a lot of interests and opinions about things. So just like where my mind goes, is where the writing goes. If you were to summarize your areas of interest, hmm. what would, what would be those buckets? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I don't write about it. Like, as prolifically anymore but I mean I when I started out I wrote a lot about you know, my faith and everything um and kind of what it meant in relation to you know just like a lot of my life events and stuff I was going through and how I you know I I haven't always been you know a Christian in my life you know I I found it when I was 20 like it makes to you know a lot of really good friends and just things I found in the church that weren't present in um in other circles I guess but that was number one, especially early on. Uh, number two would probably be like mental health, obviously, because that's an issue that's pretty close to home and in my family. And number three, it's difficult to put, I mean, probably education now because of- Yeah, I was gonna say, you've got a lot of really great insights about education and about Baltimore. I mean, there are times where you speak up about things that you see, um, be it like, the riots in Baltimore and what the effect has been. And I just always find your perspective super helpful. Yeah. Um, I try, but yeah, thank you so much.
Um, okay, last question for you. What is your latest 1D win? Uh, my latest 1D win? I mean, I guess I survived my first two days at Amazon. That was, and then like, Great I mean, point. It was, yeah. Great point. That's huge. Ryan, just for those who are watching, is now working in an Amazon warehouse. Mm -hmm. He is having the real deal experience that so many people read about. What are these warehouses like? And what is it like so far? Uh, I think there's like a just, there, I mean, I don't think that any one person can accurately summarize it because it's, the warehouse is huge. It's a maze. Um, but there's like a lot of different jobs that you can have in the warehouse. And we, I'm, you know, I went in with, uh, with my girlfriend and we're both pickers. So like you take things. Oh, from she works there too. She works with yeah. you. Uh, oh, that's we, cool. Well, it's kind of an isolating job. You kind of have your own just workstation and then you just do your job like the whole day. But, um, we do this thing where we take things from bins and put them into totes to get items ready. And I think that's one of the easier jobs in a warehouse. You know, you're not on the truck, you're not unloading, you're not, you know. Do they, how do they put you in the job? Like, what did you have to do? Like, did, were they like, do you want to be a picker? Or like, how does, how does that land? I don't really remember ever choosing me. Okay. I just like, I think they assign you where there's need. But okay. it was just crazy because, uh, you know, one, one moment I was worried about not having a summer job or any summer income, um, you know, besides medium. But um, I was just like, Oh crap! I need a summer job. I was like I should probably apply to Amazon. And then ten minutes later, I got an email, like I did some quiz, you know, put in all my information, and then I got the job. And it was like it was just like that fast. And I was like, Wow! Oh, yeah, they are on it. Yeah, and it's like, is it, it was, all types of people? Like who who else is in the warehouse? Yeah, um, there's like a lot of people that work in the warehouse um, in a lot of different roles, but I think it's just. I don't know. It's, it's, it's just a huge warehouse. So like you're bound to see um, a lot of people and a lot of people doing a lot of different things, but um, it's not like all automated, you know, there's still like a human component to it, but the job application process certainly was just like, oh, wow. Yeah, sounds like it. Yeah. And is there a lot of COVID stuff like, or, you know, or is it, does it seem like, because mm -hmm. we keep hearing the controversies, like people aren't, you know, taken care of and they're not separate enough. Like what's your, it sounds like you're, kind of alone when you do your stuff yeah i mean you do have to interact with people but they, they take i mean obviously they, they do take COVID very seriously and they you know we have to hold these like trackers to make sure we're within like six feet distance of from other people you know and like they do like and like the first thing that happened when we went in for the first day of orientation and stuff like they, they kept telling us to move apart from each other you know like mm -hmm. for good reason do you um, have to wear a mask do you wear a mask yeah yeah definitely have to wear a mask it's a long day 10 hours of that mask is a lot yeah um and like I mean, you can take it off to eat and stuff during your breaks but otherwise yeah. yeah like i think you'll be reprimanded for not wearing a mask what is the poster behind you what does that say witness uh, what is it i think it's a it's an album from one of my girlfriend's favorite bands bless the fall i think it's nice. like a yeah, we we saw one of their concerts in Baltimore um, a while back. So that's awesome. Is your girlfriend a writer too? She writes a bit about music and stuff like that. But I tried. I gave her. Uh, I gifted her a media membership, and I'm trying to get her more involved in uh, <laughs> in the platform. And I also gifted, you know, one of my friends from college, Andrew. Uh, I gifted him a media membership as well, and he's been he's been killing it actually. And he's been, you know, medium is super lucky to have you. <laughs> medium <laughs> is so lucky to have you. But uh, I'm just glad, you know, I, I enjoy it a lot. And my, I met a lot, so many cool people like, you know, you, Juliet, uh, Marie, Nikki, and everyone else um, through Invisible Illness. And also other people that are just writers, you know, because um, like, you know, it was a little isolating at first just because like, you know, I in the beginning, I like, I was like, oh, like, I feel like you're just putting your work out there and that's it. And like, Oh, I know you're just sitting there. You're like, well, is this going anywhere into the abyss? Yeah. Um, and then I found like the much bigger community of people who just struggle with the same things and like, you know, thought about the same things in relation to medium and stuff like that. So um, I try to help out new writers as much as I can and like kind of preach like, you know, your first couple months or so are probably not going to overwhelm you know you're, they're not going to overwhelm you or, or anyone and stuff like that it's okay to get only five reads it happens <laughs> <laughs> well uh but 
yeah, it's just, it's, it's a lot of fun. And I enjoy being on it a lot. You know, like I think over the course of the school years, like medium was kind of my outlet for, um, for a school. And like, I, once I put, you know, boundary on work, then medium and stuff like that. It's smart. That's really mm-hmm. smart. Ryan, thank you so much for your time. I've loved talking to you. It's so great to get to meet you face yeah. to face um, after all this time. Yeah. Thanks a thank lot, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.